praise the Lord and a happy Thanksgiving to you. And so I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. Our topic is giving thanks to God. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. No doubt we are thankful for the name of Jesus all the time. Amen. Because it's his name that we got salvation. And through his name, we have deliverance. We have victory. It's in his name. Hallelujah. So we give thanks to Jesus Christ, to God Almighty. Thanksgiving is a time to remember the harvest. Of course, we have the uh, history of the first Thanksgiving in the United States. Well, they didn't know that they were actually creating the first Thanksgiving, but that's really what happened. The pilgrims had come over from England, rejoiced later after the first hard, terrible winter that many people died. And uh, so the Indians helped them to uh, plant crops and they had crops to help them, crops to help them eat, be healthy and not starve or be susceptible to sicknesses and disease without food. And so they celebrated their first Thanksgiving with the Indians. And so to remember their hardship, to remember that God had provided for them and gave them a great harvest, we celebrate Thanksgiving in remembrance of the food. Thanksgiving is a day to thank God for the food that we have been blessed with. It is a way to say our appreciation for what God has blessed us with. Of course, every time that we eat we should pray before we eat and give thanks to God all the time today more than ever before people can and should be able to get food food can be transported to wherever it is needed quickly efficiently and effectively that is the point the whole point of our thanksgiving to God besides the many other blessings that he has given to us Nevertheless, daily food is needed for those who are not fasting, but daily he blesses us in ways that we may not know or even comprehend. Even beyond what we really think about or are even thankful about to him. It is something that people should always be thankful to God for. Amen. Thus, we are thankful to God, so we pray before we eat, we thank him for it. Moreover, during Thanksgiving, it is more of a time to really put our eyes on remembering all the days that we have enjoyed the blessings of food. Hallelujah. The abundance of food that he has given to us. But since we are the sons of God and the children of the highest, we should also give thanks to God for the spiritual food that he blesses us with. Amen. He's given us a lot of spiritual food and enriches us in a spiritual light. For it's stated in Revelation chapter 14 and 15, the following concerning the harvest. And I was kind of excited when I read this. Of course, we've probably read it before, but when we read it during Thanksgiving, it's like, oh, that's cool. And it says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come to, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, if you take it in a physical light, it is, uh, obviously, the, the food comes up. But the food has been coming up from the time way back, even when Joseph was alive, there was a lot of harvest in Egypt. So here, <clears throat> this is uh, the earth is ripe, referring to the people are ready for salvation. They're ready, ready for the true harvest. And so Acts chapter two began the time of the church age, the time when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And so we have received or we have the possibility in this time to receive the Holy Spirit. 
though thus the real blessings is with the spiritual harvest of souls. That is what we should be thankful of to God about too. So much the more. So it is the spiritual harvest and with those who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. It started in Acts chapter 2. And what a change, really, it makes in a person's life. They were rejoicing because they had received what the promised, uh, what the promise was a long time ago that Joel chapter two he promised, or uh, through God by God's word he, pr he promised that there would be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And so, in Acts chapter two, that's what happened. That is really the harvest that the Bible talks about. Certainly, Israel celebrated the day of Pentecost, a day to celebrate the harvest and a day to celebrate a physical harvest, like, you know, food that we eat every day. But when we're talking about Revelation chapter 14 and 15, and their earth is ripe, it's ready for harvest. It's talking about the uh, spiritual harvest. Amen. And so Acts chapter 2 came the day of Pentecost, and that was a blessing. Amen. Certainly Israel celebrated the day of Pentecost. Today we celebrate Pentecost in a different way. We celebrate it thanking God for the Holy Spirit, and that is our harvest celebration. Because we have been, we have been become part of the harvest, and the harvest for souls is continuing on and should be celebrated every year. In John chapter 6, 27, I love this verse, and it's just been on my mind a lot lately. It says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath, the God, hath God the Father sealed. Amen. So here we understand. And uh, uh, we also should believe, <laughs> hallelujah, that <clears throat> people should labor not so much for the meat that perishes. Obviously, we're going to have to labor in some way if we want to eat. I mean, we're going to have to cook some food. But the focus, the attention is not on that food. The focus should be more on spiritual food on the food that endureth to everlasting life for here it says the meat that it, which endureth unto everlasting life is that meat that continues on amen that's the good good news that is the salvation message that is the gospel message that is you know, what is brings into the life of a man perfection the counsel of the word of God is not laboring so much for that which perisheth. That is the meat that goes into the belly, comes out, and then it's gone. But the counsel is to put more emphasis on laboring for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Amen. And uh, we have a physical body. We eat and then the food takes care of our body. Uh, spiritual food takes care of the uh, church body. Amen. And uh, that endures unto everlasting life. We know that the Bible says that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, shall give it unto us that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Because people give thanks to God for the meat which pareth it and goeth into the belly, for our bodily health, how much more should we really give thanks to God for the meat which does not perish? <clears throat> that in itself should be that which we give thanks God to God more and more and much more plentifully. Why? Because that's the, you know, we get uh, riches, eternal riches, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The truth is, there are eternal benefits for us. The word of truth, the gospel of salvation, has been preached to us. 
and through the word of truth, the gospel, when we have obeyed it, it leads to eternal life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 10 to 15, it says, Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God for the administration of this service, not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and, to, and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his, for his unspeakable gift. Amen. So I thought about that, the unspeakable gift. Well, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we actually do speak in tongues. So, but that uh, word unspeakable, of course, it is talking about something that is just unexplainable. Uh, it, words cannot really um, explain about this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, how how beautiful it actually is that we have received it. So it explains more in detail of the word of God that is being sown and that it states is very important for that. No doubt Christians should be very thankful to God for every time that we hear and can learn the word of God. For the word of God sustains our, our spiritual life. Amen. Praise God. There is the ministration of the seed sown, meaning that people get bread that is spiritual bread from heaven. In the Old Testament, the Israelites received manna from heaven. And so they were able to get something to eat every single day. Except for Sunday, then they got double portion on uh, Saturday. Or I mean, uh, for the Sabbath, they got double portion before the Sabbath. <clears throat> and for the saint, the ones who attend the church, there they get what they need for their spiritual sustenance. The one in states who ministers provides bread, which also multiplies too. When it goes into a heart, it can be testified about what the word of God has done for the person. A person's life can be changed dramatically. Further, it is through that that fruit grows and becomes abundant. That is, our righteousness grows in leaps and bounds, one can say. And also it states being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. No doubt there, it refers to the enrichment of a spiritual light due to ministering the seed sown. When people receive of the heavenly seed, that seed of the kingdom of God, one notes that the seed brings forth wonderful, such wonderful blessings. The righteousness and the enrichment in Jesus Christ. That spiritual enrichment is available today for the people of God as they listen to the word of God and begin to hear its precepts. It, it is the true message of salvation. It gives people true wisdom, the wisdom that first, that puts the importance, the focus on Jesus Christ in one's life, more important than the world. The world and the riches of the world are not first in the Christian's life. In fact, any, the Bible even says that we should not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hallelujah. The world and the riches of the world are not 
the focal point in the Christian's life. We do live in this world and we have to deal with the things that happen in this world. And sometimes it gets a little bit irritating. <laughs> but we still hold on to Jesus Christ. First is salvation. First is Jesus. He's our focus. He's our love. Amen. And so we are focused also on the truth of the word of God. The church becomes enriched when we deal with the word of God and find that heavenly treasure. Amen. And help souls to get into the kingdom of God. Such a blessing it is. The Apostle Paul, hallelujah, said that this should give us gratefulness. Amen. The word supplies the want of the saints. It comes further. It comes out in abundance towards the saints of God. We receive the word of God and we, we love the word of truth. No doubt the enrichment does not refer so much to the outward physical um, enrichment, meaning material things. But it refers more to the spiritual things. For the Apostle Paul, even in his time, he was not rich in the way of physical riches. And Jesus was not either. But they were spiritually rich. And so Paul began to write. And God gave him a lot to give to the church today and throughout the entire, entire church age and even on into eternity. Hallelujah. So he, excuse me, had written that which would become the canon of Scripture. Thus, the enrichment of the people of God comes along those lines, reading, studying, and hearing the word of God, obeying it and following its precepts. Amen. Also, the Apostle Paul states, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thus, we should be those who thank God for providing to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hey, that's a most wonderful gift. It's the gift of God himself. Hallelujah. It is unspeakable. What does it mean, that unspeakable gift? The Apostle Paul is saying that when one receives the Holy Spirit, it's not, excuse me, he's not saying that one receives the Holy Spirit does not speak. Well, he does because um, one does uh, speak in tongues. That is not the case. On the day of Pentecost, when the 120 received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they all spoke in tongues. Amen. So you can't say it's an unspeakable gift in that way. Uh, as the Spirit of God was giving them the utterance. Therefore, the unspeakable part of it means it is indescribable. It is mean. It means that there are no real human words that can really go to the depth. I mean, it's like, can you describe God? Yes, I can describe God in a way that he is eternal. He is um, omnipotent he's omniscient and but you know there's so much about god that we really do not know i mean the the depth of knowing him i mean we know that his name is jesus we know that he came we know that he loves us we know the word of god and things like this but <clears throat> to really get down more deeply in describing god <laughs> Well, the, the Spirit of God dwells in us, and that is indescribable. Words cannot really define it. It's just something so amazing, so beautiful, something so excellent. The top of the line words, like way up here at the top, that's what it's like. But words in our vocabulary cannot really explain the beautifulness, the wonderfulness of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. So he is tr so, truly so wonderful that words cannot express how really great it is. And then he begins to, well, 
in that scripture, hallelujah, in uh, sec, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he refers to the fact that there is a liberal distribution going on. And it is also saying abundant. So when we, for example, hear the word of God or, or uh, speak the word of God, both should be abundant. We should be listening abundantly. We should be speaking abundantly of the word of God. According to the word of God, the Apostle Paul being used of God to write about the word of God, he he was able to write the word of God and wrote to the Corinthian people, the people that, according to what he had stated, really didn't want to give him tithes and, and, and give him a lot of money for what he had done by sowing that, you know, spiritual seed in them. But yet he still wrote a letter. In fact, he wrote two letters to, to the Corinthians. And, oh, he, he didn't really care so much for their material blessings. But he was, you know, we could say that the material blessings, when a, um, a minister is being blessed in the material by those that are in the congregation or what have you, by the word of God that he speaks, it just kind of like adds to their... Uh, to the to the ministers uh, preaching is like it's some it's like a sacrifice you know and so the sacrifice goes a higher and higher and higher pretty soon God is just blessing the ministry too hallelujah so we should be um, abundantly you know giving but uh, also in the word of God uh, we, one could say the minister should be in a, uh, speaking abundantly about the word of God. Hallelujah. The apostle Paul used of God, he wrote, you know, 14 books in the New Testament. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of books, according to, you know, the if you look at how many uh, other writers have written, we don't have another writer that wrote 14 books. We do have Moses that wrote five in the Old Testament, and they're pretty long books, but uh, Paul wrote 14. Hallelujah. And Paul was writing to the church, and Moses, he was writing to Israel at that time. Hallelujah. So what does abundant mean? Abundant means in great quantity, having great plenty, Having plenty, uh, more than sufficient or abounding. The word of God by those who preach the word of God should be abundant, you know, in that aspect. Now, Thanksgiving is a time to thank God, no doubt, for the Holy Spirit too. We thank God for the food, the spiritual food. We thank God for his spirit. Since we give the Lord thanks for the harvest, then it follows that the church folk, because we are the spiritual harvest, we have received the Holy Spirit, we should thanks God, thank God for have, uh, giving us his Holy Spirit. It is that which we received of God, that Holy Spirit, and we became the harvest, and we should be thankful to God for what God has given to us. Since the Bible declares to us that the harvest of the spirit, the, the harvest of the earth is ripe, that means that God's power is that which we are waiting for, the Holy Spirit, and also baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. We should thank God for that baptism, because the name, Hallelujah, isn't that the first uh, scripture that we had read by him therefore let us offer the th sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name we should give thanks to the name of Jesus this is a you know day of thanksgiving yes we thank God for the food yes we thank God for spiritual food yes we thank God for this and that but also thanks God for his name his name that delivered us, his name that gives us forgiveness of sins, his name does a wonderful, wonderful thing. Amen. Praise God. Give thanks to the Lord for his name. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. In First Chronicles chapter 16, 34, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Because God is good to us all the time, really. That is something to be thankful for. Further, because of the mercy of God, we are able to have his forgiveness forever. But also is something to be thankful for. Colossians chapter 3 and 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You know, everybody, usually people want peace. But here he has to say, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. <clears throat> it's like um, sometimes we get angry. And then, you know, there's anger on the one end and there's peace on the other. And who's going to win? <laughs> That's kind of funny. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, not the anger. Don't let that rule. Let peace rule. To the which also ye are called in one body and be thankful. Thus here, as stated by the Apostle Paul, it is the fact that Christians should allow that peace of God to rule in their hearts. That is one of our callings. Another is, yes, to be thankful. That is, we are called not only to allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts, but it is also to be thankful to God. Amen. That is a very precious thing to remember, especially during this time of the year. Praise God. We are called to be thankful. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, I thank my God always on your behalf. So here is an example by Paul stating to the Corinthians that he thanked God for them. Yeah, it is true that Paul had gone through some, again, we go back to the same thing. He he had trouble sometimes with them because they were not giving to him, you know, uh, any, uh, uh, we could say, an abundant of um, tithes or, 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 or offerings enough for him to, to not work. He had to go to work, the poor fellow. He had to go to work and, uh, you know, make tents. He was a tent maker. And so he did that because uh, the Corinthians, they were, you know, something. I don't know what kind of uh, mentality they had, but they were just like, well, he doesn't deserve it or whatever. I don't know. But he says, I thank my God. First Corinthians chapter one and verse number four. It says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. He still thanked God for them. Here the Apostle Paul is thanking the Lord for the Corinthian church folk that had listened to the message of the gospel and who had received it with open arms. Uh, the apostle states he was thanking God for the grace that had been given to them by Jesus Christ. Amen. That's such a blessing. Thus, the church folks should be thankful for one another. He says, I thank my God always on, on your behalf. We should be thankful for one another. We should be thankful for our family. We should be thankful. Amen. Thank God for the parents that God has given to us. Thank God. Amen. The Apostle Paul ha may have had the opportunity to eat pork. You know, Peter was uh, shown a vision from God and and um, <clears throat> this, these animals were coming down from heaven. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Coming down from heaven and, and, and you know, God says, rise, Peter eat and he said not so lord here comes animals down from heaven that's kind of funny anyway <clears throat> uh, peter said no 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 i can't and then god says hey what i have cleansed don't call that don't call that common or unclean don't call it unclean go ahead enjoy it Eat it, Peter. It's a different time. You're in the church age. Don't worry about those uh, traditions of not eating pork anymore. Go ahead and have some pork. 
I cleaned it up. Well, the Apostle Paul, he must have had the same opportunity to eat pork because he was dealing with the Gentiles all the time. But he never really wrote about it saying, well, I ate with so-and-so and, -so and they, they accused me, the Jews accused me. He never did really say it like that. <clears throat> but he must have had an opportunity to eat pork and other other kind of meats that the Jews did not eat. And the Gentiles, though, they feasted on him. He was an apostle to the Gentiles, so that means that he had many opportunities to do so. And so, but he does say to Timothy this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 4 to 5, it says, For every creature of God is good. Timothy says, you mean a pig is good to eat, Paul? And then uh, Paul said, yes, it's good to eat. You can go ahead and eat it. He says, for every creature of God is good, meaning that you can eat every creature. Well, I w there are some creatures I prefer not to eat, but he says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. So that means, well, if he's going to put it into practice, that means Paul must have done it too. And then he said, but at the here it says, but if it be received with thanksgiving, so that's why we pray before we eat the food, if it be received with thanksgiving, every creature is of God is good and nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving for, hallelujah. So it says, for every creature of God is good. I could, you know, we could, should make it into a song. For every creature of God is good. Hey, he's given us liberty, Peter. Hey, he's given us liberty. Paul, <laughs> too, he understood that. Peter had had to, you know, get a vision and God speak to him. And finally, hey, you know, I've cleansed it. Eat it. So for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Amen. Thus, just in this verse, one gets the idea of what the Apostle Paul was writing. It did not matter if it were a pig, pork or ham or any other animal that Jews normally did not eat. He stated that nothing was to be refused, meaning that all the foods, including pork or any other meat by him, could be eaten and nothing could, should be refused. Nothing to be refused, as we said, before one eats. He was saying, though, that one should pray for it, no doubt, before one eats it. And one should, in that prayer to God, thank him, give thanks to God for the food that one is about to eat. So this is the scripture that gives that indication. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, there's something here that Paul explains, you know, in everything, give thanks. Well, that means in the good things, which is, you know, pretty easy to give thanks to God for. Give thanks to God for the good that he has provided to us. But then there comes to, along the line uh, sometimes that we get some things that are bad. Bad things happen to us. Still, we should give thanks. Well. We got an example here. Uh, Paul, of course, with Silas, they were preaching. They got thrown into prison. <laughs> and they were beaten, of course. They had been beaten. Now they, <clears throat> uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul here to the Thessalonians said, in everything give thanks. So that must have been, excuse me, that must have been why when he was in the prison with Silas, they began to sing, just praising God and giving thanks to God. It made no difference to them. Of course, it hurt. <laughs> it must have hurt, but he, they, they probably wanted to sing louder than the hurt hurt them. Said, gee, and then just started praising God. And then maybe, 
after that praising and singing, all of a sudden their body starts feeling a little bit better and soothing. And then there was an earthquake and it goes, oh no, what's going on? Well, God was answering and, and he opened up the prison doors and everybody was, you know, that's kind of like a, a symbol when we praise God, when we call upon him, especially, especially during the times when, you know, it's hard to give thanks to God. God just sees that faithfulness that we give thanks to him in everything during the good and the bad. And he is, you know, going to uh, bless us probably even more so during the time that we give thanks to him when things are not going the right direction, it seems like. But it actually is because that's the direction that he had planned it for us. And or we made some mistakes and we're trying to get uh, right. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so here he says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, to that you give thanks to God during the good times and the bad times. Amen. In everything give thanks. Really, one should rejoice evermore, meaning that one rejoices in good news and in tragic news. Though no doubt no one wants to hear of tragic news, one still should rejoice and give thanks to Jesus Christ. For in reading this scripture, one knows that one should give thanks to the Lord God for everything and in everything. That is, the Christian should have learned to give thanks to the Lord God for everything that one has. Further, in everything that is, everything both good and bad that happens to a person, one should definitely be thankful for it. This scripture points to the fact that the Christian has an obligation, obligation to give to God thanks for the good he sends and the bad that one goes through in order to give the glory to God. Job went through some serious trouble, yet he didn't curse God and die. He blessed God and lived. <laughs> he didn't curse God and die like uh, his <clears throat> wife had said. And, uh, but he blessed God and he lived. Amen. Job went through that serious trouble. And still, he had a blessing in his mouth for God. In everything, we should give thanks. Amen. In everything that, you know, God gives to us or takes away, gives to us or takes away. The Christian, likewise, should give God thanks for everything good and everything bad. Sometimes, no doubt, it's the hardships that one does not want to face and he feels bad about. Yet, <clears throat> there is, that, that really, in the eyes of God, he wants to see that during the bad times, we can really give him thanks too. Of course, he loves to give us the good things, but also when we go through the bad things, he wants to see, hey, are they really going to give thanks? Amen. Praise God. Instead of looking at the things that are only good to give God praise, that is easier, but it should be those things that are bad. Also, we should give thanks to God. And uh, not only just by our words, but our actions in thankfulness to God on a grander scale. Amen. So, enjoy Thanksgiving. Give thanks to God.